I think this fight is the most important fight of the year. It's bigger than big. It's huge because we're looking at a possible changing of the guard. Jermaine Taylor is the biggest, strongest, fastest middleweight I've ever seen. It is hard to imagine that you could pack more into an 160-pound package. The hard part is not going to be me beating Bernard. The hard part is going to be me holding on to the belts for as long as he did. Jermaine Teller is young, strong, but I refuse to lose to a guy that live in Arkansas. I'm a Philadelphia guy. Bernard Hopkins is cagey, slick. He can also be very mean. There are times if you piss him off, where he can actually revert to being that thug, that guy who's in jail. He wants revenge for various reasons, and he wants vindication. He wants to prove that people were wrong about him. I describe Jermaine Teller as a guy that's in school and still learning. I'm here to say, well, here's the test. See, can you pass it? Bernard will do whatever Bernard has to do to win. Will Jermaine Taylor do that? We don't know. He has never been in that situation. But he has to be absolutely evil. I don't know if Little Rock is the last place you'd expect a terrific middleweight prospect to emerge from. In boxing terms, it's like a rare flower, an orchid that comes out of the street someplace. How did this happen? I was about six years old when my dad left. Then I had to become the man of the house. My mother had to work, you know, and I had to come home and to take care of my sisters. You know, I had to wash dishes, make sure all of them ate. He made sure that we ate took our baths and went to bed. I have three younger sisters, and they kept me in fights. Guys just, you know, they're intimidated by Jermaine, so we tried not to have anybody around when Jermaine was around. <laughs> when I was a kid, well, I still do. I stutter. So, you know, I had a hard time, you know, on the talking game. Well, I do this to you and you do this to me, you know. I, I got a hard time in doing it. So I was always the one just put your dukes up, let's go for it. It's cute to us. You know, we used to it. It's nothing new. I can remember, you know, times in class, school, I was a, you know, I had to read. And the teacher picked me every time. And she would pick me to read, and, and, I, and I would be reading, and I'd look who laughing. OK? OK? <laughs> they probably thought he was kind of a shy boy or something because he, you know, stuttered a little bit. But once he beat him down, then they wouldn't do it no more. <laughs> From an early age, he hasn't been able to talk trash the way that other boxers have. I think that's honestly helped him, and that's made him become not just the boxer he is today, but also the person he is today. The reason why he don't talk trash is because he doesn't need to. Jermaine may have that nice little country smile, nice, sweet personality, but underneath that, I know there's a tough street thug side of him. Jermaine came from the south side of Little Rock, and it was well known back then that Little Rock had some gang problems. We didn't live in a mansion or nothing like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, we stayed in a rough neighborhood growing up. It was just guys just walking the streets constantly with a red rag, a blue rag. The thing that kept me out of trouble is when I met my coach, Ozell Nelson. And, you know, he showed me a different way. His mother at first did not want Jermaine to box. And so he wanted me to talk to his mother about boxing. And his mother said, no way her son going to get brain dead, you know, in no boxing ring. I've been doing nursing all my life, and I take care of people. And Jermaine, you know, he does boxing for a living. So it, that, that's a little, you know, hard to take. I used to drive around the neighborhood to pick up kids to bring out to my judge in order to have kids to box. And I was passing through uh, Jermaine's neighborhood, and his mother flagged me down, told me, all right, coach, go ahead and take it. So apparently I knew something was wrong, and I was saying Jermaine had gotten into a little trouble. And later on, I found out that Jermaine was trying to get into a game. And from that day on, Jermaine been with me. Coach came and picked Jermaine up every single day, every day after school, and take him to the gym, bring him back home. He taught Jermaine how to be a man. He used the gym where other kids would use a street and guns. He had the same kind of rage, but he didn't want to use it on the streets. He took it out in the heavy bag in the gym. 
That's what I'm trying to make it to, to the Olympics. That's my goal. Jermaine Taylor is the first Arkansan to ever make the Olympic boxing team. I made it to the Olympics, man. Oh, amazing feeling. When he made the Olympic team, hey, that was our dream. He lost to the eventual gold medal winner to win the bronze. And there was no doubt that of all the people on the US Olympic team, if anyone was going to make it big quickest, it was going to be Jermaine Taylor. The opening ceremonies, I felt like this is it, man. I want to do this for the rest of my life. Bernard is an unusual character and personality in boxing because he's used his street rage in a positive way to keep him going for the longest time, uh, to live the life of a boxer long after most successful boxers stop living it. I was born in Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia, January 15th, 1965. I started boxing when I was about seven, eight years old. He's a Philly guy. He's a Philly, a Philly street kid who's gone through the hard knocks in life. I did all my mysteries and negative stuff up in, up in the avenue. We call it the avenue, um, where everybody hang out at, where everybody uh, uh, see each other and, and, and things like that. I wanted to see the guy who had the girls, who had the, who had the gold chain, who had the car, who was popular, who, who had the respect. You know, that was what I thought was my hero. Back then, Bernard Hockman was a guy that, I don't care who you is or what you say you can do, I'm the baddest guy in the world, I'm the baddest guy on the planet. I was robbing guys that was sort of like on the same path that I was on. I wasn't looking for the humper dink of the little guy coming with a with high waters on with a lunch bag with thick glasses going to school. I was getting guys that I knew wouldn't tell. I was looking for guys for street credibility and reputation. You're not going to the police officers and say, Bernard just took all my jewelry. And Bernard just took a, you know, he, he, he just took all my money out of my pocket. I want to file a complaint. I've been stabbed twice. I mean, that happened by two different people. Um, one close to my heart and one close to my spine in the back. So I have tasted, you can say, um, death. He was a tough guy, uh, made a lot of mistakes when he was young, following the crowds, the tough guys in the neighborhood. I was in and out of juvenile about between 20 and 25 times, maybe 30, just back and forth. Fights, robberies, whatever, Bernard did it. He graduated from tough school and went to prison. I got sentenced to 5 to 12 for eight assaults and two robberies. My year uh, that I went to the penitentiary was the year that Melchick Teller and Pernell Whitaker and Holyfield and Mark Breeling, that great Olympic team in 84, that was the team that I could have tried out for. Bernard didn't go to the local county lockup. I mean, he was in, incarcerated with the toughest of the tough of Pennsylvania. And Bernard survived that. And it's there where he decided, hey, it's time for me to change my path. Boxing paved the way mentally for me to be out of graded for. Of course, I felt stiff. I felt, you know, I got bear kind of on me. I used to smoke reefer. But now, the only thing I had to do is, like, detox. Not only was I getting better, I was getting to know my body, knowing what's good for me, like the, to eat, what not to eat, how to train, how to run. I became more disciplined. I think Bernard's even prouder of his background as an ex-con than he is of being a fighter. I had a good prison record when I was in penitentiary. I was respected. I was their champion. Guy's a trouble street kid. Guy goes to prison. Guy comes out of prison. The day he left prison, uh, the warden came to him and said, uh, I just want to tell you one thing. I'll be here when you come back. And, and Bernard said, I'm never coming back. I think the fact that Jermaine Taylor had a good amateur background was very important. Uh, so he's very well prepared from his foundation. And then he still has a little arrogance, cockiness about him. And uh, you have to watch very careful to see it. The guy's had 23 fights. He's never lost a round. Every single round, he gets uh, better and better and better. He's not just winning um, conservative decisions. He's throwing hooks and knocking people out. He's the biggest, strongest, fastest middleweight I've ever seen. It, it is hard to imagine that you could pack more into an 160-pound package 
than Jermaine Taylor has in his body. Jermaine Taylor is a kid that has a good style, good left jab, good intensity, and surprisingly has made good adjustments in the fights that I have saw him in. When he fought Raul Marquez, Marquez was bending at angles, being southpaw, and much experience. And eventually, he started to change it up, shortening his punches up, throwing punches from little angles where he could anticipate the uh, body movements of Marquez and, and made his adjustments and systematically stopped Marquez, realizing that he wasn't going to be able to do it with one single punch. So he systematically broke him down and, and adjusted to his style. And I was very impressed with that. Joppy was an aging fighter that was past his prime. Jermaine exploited that from the first round on and just beat up Joppy's face. He took his time, went to the body, and he dropped Joppy with a left hook. I don't know that Jermaine Taylor fully realizes how much this is an audition for a possible fight for Bernard Hopkins should he win later tonight. He landed two or three solid shots, and he jumped on the guy, and he rallied off about eight or nine shots. And it, he was hitting the kid so fast and so hard that the kid couldn't drop. He's had a lot of fights like that. He has walked through everyone, but let's look at who he's walked through. He hasn't fought very many middleweights. He's fought basically welterweights who've moved up, junior middleweights who've moved up. Uh, he did fight William Joppy, the best name, the most impressive name on his resume. But Joppy, at that point, was a beaten fighter. That's the only pure, true middleweight test that he's had, which is why he's going to have a tough time with Hopkins. The difference in quality of opposition is, for a fight of this magnitude, is so huge that I'm not sure Jermaine can overcome that. That'll be difficult for him. We knew that Jermaine Taylor was going to take some time to reach the pinnacle of his own ability and to reach where he needed to be to face the Bernard Hopkins. We never viewed it as a one or two year plan. We viewed it as a four year plan. And basically four years from his turning pro, we made the deal for this fight. The Joppy fight, the fight with Raul Marquez, and the last fight with Daniel Edward, those three fights were designed to get him exactly to where he is, to the moment that we all believe, his trainer, his management, his fans, and his promoter, that he's ready to unseat the undisputed middleweight champion of the world. I'm working in a roofing union um, called Rizzo Roofing. We replace old roofs with new roofs, and we build the, the ones that really are tore up or messed up, you know, breathing this black smoke coming out of a big kettle that's burning tar. I got paid like 300 a week. I worked, got my money, and then I started easing into the gym because I ran into a person that worked at the roofing union that started talking about boxing. And that's where boxing started coming into play. The Philly fighter, in essence, it's somebody who's come out of probably the most competitive, the most heavily populated, the most intense American laboratory for the sport. Bernard has an enormous reverence for all of that. I lost my first pro fight in 88, met Bowie Trisha at the end of 1990. Bowie is my trainer for 18 years now. And I've been listening and learning. He was a tough guy. I know how to fight. He wanted to fight. But some things that he had to learn and had to sharpen his skills on, I like to think that I helped him in that, in that department. I lost one fight with uh, Bowie, and that's it. The thing with Bernard Hopkins is he, he appears to have no bad habits. He has never lost sight of the fact, uh, most importantly, that he is a fighter. He's not a singer, he's not a dancer, he's not an actor, he's not a wannabe anything, except he'd like to be considered the greatest middleweight of, of all time. I think his professional career has been a series of vindications for him. He's always been trying to prove first that he, he could stay out of jail, and then that he could uh, be a successful fighter and he could become a champion. It's all about proving himself and getting revenge. 
Hopkins imposing his will and his skill. Everything he does in the ring is for the purpose of winning the fight. That's a longer, harder road to respect than the bond that a fighter generates with the audience if he fights in a crowd-pleasing style. You might have to see Bernard Hopkins eight, nine, ten times before you fully appreciate the genius of what you're watching. The Felix Trinidad fight is really the fight that lifted Bernard Hopkins. The Trinidad fight was big because they never gave me a chance to win. They never thought that I can beat him. They thought that Trinidad was a guy that was unbeatable. And not only did I predict, and not only did I boldly tell the world that I will either knock him out, punish him, or his father will rescue him and save him. All three of those things happened. I took Trinidad to school, and uh, you know, it, that, that's, that was masterful. Now, after beating Trinidad, it was basically four years before he had a, a, another major fight, which is pretty amazing. People thought he sabotaged his career because he managed himself. He turned down a fight with Roy Jones because he, the money wasn't right for him. I don't think you can really say that Bernard Hopkins sabotaged his own career by his single-mindedness, his determination to battle the establishment of boxing, managers, promoters, sanctioning buddies, refused to tie himself up with the big-time promoters, and so on. Uh, maybe the argument can be made that he might have made a little bit more money. I don't even know if that would be true. But in terms of his success as a prize fighter, at the end of the day, he made his point. He proved his point. They said I was a fool. They said I was mismanaging myself. They said I was an idiot. Bernard Hawkins is talking the same way now, with four belts later, five, 10 years later, 20 defenses later. So the ones that criticized me for making bad decisions, the ones that criticized me for being a bad manager this year in Las Vegas, the Boxing Association of America Award, the most prestigious award you can get other than fight of the year and training of the year. They gave me manager of the year. I think that Bernard is rather proud of the fact that he's done it his way. And in some ways, doing it in his own style has made Bernard have to wait much longer to get to the Holy Grail. But he got there with help from Oscar De La Hoya. My sense of him as a fighter is the guy can wait. Bernard Hopkins is beginning to physically punish Oscar De La Hoya. He was in jail for five years. He, he waited about 10 years before anybody knew who he was as a boxer. And in the ring, he's the same way. You know, if he has to wait another two, three rounds before he takes you out, you know, he's got the time. He can wait. You can see each round, but now we're just getting closer and closer to walking De La Hoya into that left hook to the body. It's a Bernard Hopkins knockout of Oscar De La Hoya in the ninth round. I feel ribs. I felt his bones. I mean, it was a good, quick shot. It wasn't a shot coming from back here like a Hail Mary. It was a short six-inch punch. And he uh, gasped like that, and the mouthpiece jumped out. And I knew it was a good shot. I knew it was a good shot. And I know, I know for a fact that De La Hoya, if he would have got up in time, he couldn't have continued. The undisputed middleweight champion of the world, Bernard. The Executioner Hopkins! I fight everybody different. I fought Trinidad different. I fought De La Hoya different. I fought Howard Eastman different. I can come forward and beat you. I can go backwards and beat you. I can go side to side and beat you. Or I can bite down my mouthpiece and say, come on, mano no mano. He's one of the best middle ways that ever lived. And I'm not ashamed to say that. He's defended the, the title more than any other middleweight. I think he's equivalent to Marvin Hagler. Their styles are really similar. Bernard Hopkins has to be one of the top five or six middleweights of all time. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Robinson, Tommy Hearns, Carlos Manzon. Hopkins is right there. You'd be hard pressed to find four or five middleweights that you think were better. Even though Bernard Hopkins has been considered as maybe one of the greatest middleweights of all time, personally myself, I uh, have reservations. I felt that he's been a very good middleweight. It happened to have been at a good time in history when there was no other good middleweights for the most part. And his claim to fame has been primarily based on beating two really 
over stuff welterweights. And that was basically beating Phoenix Trinidad and beating uh, Oscar De La Hoya. He's fought everybody. You know I mean? The way that he uh, took Trinidad apart, he exposed him, and the same way he did De La Hoya. I mean, these young guys get in there and they think that they're going to beat the old man, but it's not, it's not happening. You know I mean, he's, he's very smart. It's a huge fight. It's bigger than big, it's huge, because we're looking at a possible changing of the guard. I think this fight is the most important fight of the year. I don't know if it's the biggest or the best, but I think in terms of boxing overall, I think it's the most important fight. Rod Hopkins is arguably the greatest middleweight of his time. If you like that, just a hard-nosed guy that sort of comes in the shadow of Marvin Hagler, then you like Bernard Hopkins. Bernard Hopkins is cagey, slick. He can also be very mean in the ring. There are times, if you piss him off, where he can actually revert to being that thug, that guy who's in jail. He can be absolutely evil. When he goes into this fight, it's not really fighting Jermaine Taylor so much as he's fighting Lou DiBella. There was a time when Lou DiBella was an advisor to Hopkins. He was the middleman with Don King to try to get a fight together between myself, Keith Holmes, and, and Trinidad. And he got a flat fee to bring the produce to the produce man. I was the produce. I negotiated his deal with Don King to get him the Tito Trinidad fight. And, um, and what I got in the, as a thank you was Bernard Hopkins libeling me trying to ruin my life, spreading horrible lies. And, and the court, a, court a, a jury of his peers and an appeals court, has, has ruled that he is a malicious liar, and I've gotten my justice. The word is that Lou DiBella is counting on Jermaine Tuller to be his only horse to make it to the finish line. So he will be the second Smarty Jones to lose. He will be the guy that don't make it to the finish line and if that's the case, which it will be, then I will knock two guys out in one, one night. I think that's history. That's never been done before. He tried to put me out of business. He took his best shot. I'm still standing. I'm still standing, man. And my guy's about to knock him into another place on July 16th. I don't even pay attention to the record. I know I got 20 defenses. And Jermaine Teller will be the 21st victim that will get executed. I give Taylor a really serious chance. I don't think that Bernard Hopkins has been pushed to a limit. Bernard's taken a very big gamble. It was going to be one of his last fights of his career. And to fight somebody as promising as Taylor, as young, strong, and quick as Taylor, and as hungry as Taylor, it certainly is a very big risk for Bernard. Jermaine Taylor's chance to beat Bernard Hopkins is to physically detonate him. He has a, a laser jab. Just a, a spectacular, stinging, sharp jab. It's the kind of weapon which might enable him to force Hopkins to fight. That's been a problem for all of Hopkins' previous opponents, is to try to get him out of his envelope and make him expend some energy. I think the fight with Jermaine Taylor is going to be difficult for him to fight his style that he's been fighting recently. The left jab of Jermaine Taylor is going to be a problem. And with all experienced veteran fighters, the punch that's the most uh, effective against him is the left jab, because it's the shortest distance in the straight line. And most of the older fighters that I've saw throughout history usually had problems and often lost their titles to young fighters who had good left jabs. I'm strong here. I'm faster than here. The hard part is not going to be me beating Bernard. The hard part's going to be me holding on to the belts for as long as he did. Jermaine is, is going to get at Bernard with that jab, and Bernard is going to have to compete for three minutes of every round. And, and now we'll see if that 40-year-old body is truly um, irrational as it seems to be. This guy here is looking to hurt you. This guy is he's mean, and he will just he will rip you apart. You ask yourself, how can a guy be so gentle and such a sweet kid outside these sliding doors come in here and just want to rip your heart right out of your chest. Bernard's legacy will be shattered if Jermaine Taylor knocks him out. It's an incredible risk for a fighter like Bernard to be taking at this moment in his career because 
just as I've ranked him among the top five or six middleweights of all time, I think if Jermaine Taylor knocks him out, he's out of those rankings. It casts question on everything which has come before. You know, there's an old saying in boxing that every great champion has one more great fight left in him. This is the first time that Hopkins will be seriously challenged by a big, strong, young, true middleweight. So he'll have to find